very happy to be here and um, the work I'm presenting is very much work in progress. So I'm very much looking forward to your questions uh, and to your uh, advice uh, with what should I do with this <laughs> paper. Okay, woman. So the category of woman is, um, one could say, the subject of feminism. But as you know, um, what the term woman should mean and um, which target concept of a woman we should employ um, is kind of heavily negotiated uh, in feminist philosophy. And there are different normative proposals on the market on which target concept of a woman we should use. So for example, famously, um, Hans Langer proposed in a newspaper that a person should be understood as a woman, uh, if and only if the person is systematically subordinated along some dimensions, so economically, politically, socially, yada, yada, um, in virtue of some observed or imagined bodily features. Um, which bodily features? Well, such features that suggest a female biological role in reproduction. Um, Haslinger's account was heavily criticized, for example, by Catherine Jenkins um, for excluding certain women from the category of a woman, um, namely certain trans women. And in response to Haslinger, um, for example, Jenkins proposed a further target concept of gender, namely gender as identity, um, which is designed to include all women, uh, especially all trans women, mm, into the concept um, of a woman, uh, including those trans women who do not yet or will not ever publicly present as women. Hans Langer kind of admitted that Jenkins's critique and the critique of others um, is justified, that her concept really is um, like too trans inclusive and that, that that's a bad thing and that we should employ a target concept of a woman that is maximally inclusive. And what she later said about her proposal, and this is where it gets interesting um, for my purposes today, is that um, her proposal maybe provides a better account of what we actually mean in dominant contexts by the term woman. In general, I have the impression that feminist theorists so far have mainly focused on normative questions regarding the concept uh, of a woman and uh, concept of, of gender. But what is only just starting and um, about what there's not so much literature yet is um, the semantics of gender terms. So at least so far, I think you don't find many like, purely descriptive, hermeneutical analyses um, of the meaning of woman in the literature. And I think that this is surprising um, for at least two reasons. So. Of course, it's an interesting philosophical question what the term woman means and what gender terms uh, mean. I will focus on the, on the term woman like, uh, in my talk. But it's not only interesting, but it also affects um, disputes about, um, for example, whether trans women um, are women. So you would think that correct interpretation of such disputes or who's right in such disputes um, depends on what the term woman like, means in the English-speaking linguistic society. Secondly, um, many would think that the ameliorators project, um, sort of the normative project about um, concept of, of a woman, and the descriptive hermeneutical project are somewhat linked. So if ameliorators, for instance, are best described as changing the intention of the term woman, um, and the intention of woman has something to do with the meaning of woman. Um, then you would also think that philosophers who pursue a descriptive project on the semantics of woman describe kind of the starting point um, for the ameliorator's normative project. So for example, um, if a trans inclusive meaning of woman is already implemented because for instance, the term woman is ambiguous, um, then ameliorators in this case would not so much need um, to tackle an implementation problem regarding a trans inclusive meaning, but maybe more of an elimination problem regarding a trans exclusive meaning of woman. So my point is the ameliorators project and the descriptive hermeneutical project about the semantics of gender terms are somewhat linked. Okay. 
In my talk today, I will focus exclusively on the descriptive side of things. So um, my talk is about, it's a descriptive talk about the semantics um, of gender terms. And in particular, I want to argue for a conditional claim, namely the following. So I want to argue that if the meaning of the term woman um, turns out to be semantically variable, then we should prefer one view, one descriptive view that we find about the semantics of gender terms in the literature and to another view that we find in the literature. And then we should prefer a polysemy view about the term woman to a contextualist um, account. Okay. Mm. Very briefly, what's the structure of my talk? Well, I will comment very briefly about the antecedent um, of this conditional claim and say a few words why I think that, well, we should at least take seriously the idea that the meaning of woman is semantically variable. Then I will present um, the polysemy view and the contextualist account. And in the second part of the talk, um, I will present two criteria that were developed by Emanuel Fieban and Barbara Vetter um, in their discussions about the semantics of modals, mm, criteria that um, help to distinguish between terms that are polysemous and such terms that are merely context sensitive. And I will apply these two criteria to the case of women and, and argue that these two criteria better meet um, the polysemy view about women than the contextualist account. And in the third part, I will very briefly conclude. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, let's start with the first part. So, as promised, uh, very few words about the antecedent. So why should we even think that term women might be semantically variable? So polysemous or context sensitive, or maybe some other form um, of semantic variability. But first of all, what do I mean by saying that an expression is semantically variable? Well, mm, if an expression is semantically variable, mm, then it can have different semantic values in different content, contexts, and in this sense, uh, mean different things uh, in different contexts of use. Okay. Mm, so what's the main motivation to think that women might be semantically variable in this sense? Well, um, philosophers usually point at a divergence in uh, usage when they argue that woman is semantically variable. So they argue that, well, mm, the way English speakers use gender terms kind of seems to differ. Uh, on the one hand, there's still many contexts in which speakers use biological sex as their primary criterion for applying the term woman. Mm, that usage um, is morally contestable. Um, but I think there's also some value, and Betcher argues as much, there's also some value in just um, acknowledging that this usage um, is still around. So the usage of woman as a pure biological sex term. On the other hand, um, woman is also widely applied to trans women and thus not explicitly used um, as a biological sex term. Now, if you take facts about usage um, as a guide to linguistic meaning, then granting the term woman a certain kind of semantic variability seems like at least one attractive theoretical option. Yeah? It's not enough to rule out invariantism about woman, but I think it's enough for my purposes to show that the idea that woman is semantically variable is at least like a contender yeah, that is worthwhile considering in more detail. And this is what I will do uh, in what follows. Good. Now, um, in particular, I want to focus on two variantist proposals that you find in feminist literature, namely the idea that woman is polysemous and the idea that woman is context sensitive. So first of all, in general, what's the difference between polysemous um, or ambiguous and context sensitive terms, as I will understand it? Well, um, 
I think the difference um, is this. So context sensitive terms um, such as I, for example, um, have only one standing meaning, yeah, um, a character. And this meaning is context sensitive and determines different semantic values, contents, uh, depending on context. Ambiguous terms, on the other hand, have several standing meanings, uh, each of which is identical with a single semantic value. Okay, so context sensitive terms, one context sensitive meaning, um, ambiguous terms, several standing meanings. Okay, each of which can be operative um, in another context. Okay. Now, um, Talia Batchelor argues that the term woman is ambiguous, yeah? that it has two meanings. One meaning is a trans-inclusive kind of gender-related meaning. Um, the other meaning is trans-exclusive and focuses on biological sex. So it's a sex-related meaning. Um, for my purposes, it's not really important to analyze these two meanings in detail. Um, and I'm also open to further suggestions. So maybe there are also three meanings um, of woman, maybe another social meaning or so. I will just stick to this idea that woman has two meanings, um, but I don't know, I'm, I'm open to, to further suggestions here. Okay. Um, what kind of ambiguity is attributed by Batcher? Well, <laughs> the view is called the polysemy view, so I think it's polysemy. Linguists and philosophers of language, philosophers of language uh, usually distinguish between two kinds of ambiguity, homonymy and polysemy. What's the difference? Well, um, the meanings of polysemous terms um, are closely related to each other, while the meanings of homonymous terms um, are not closely related to each other. So what do I mean by closely related? Um, I think um, you can clarify that best by way of example. So here are a few examples. So for example, look at the term newspaper. Mm, this term has several meanings, maybe one for a business organization and one for a printed publication, maybe a few more. And now the idea is that the printed publication meaning and the like, application house, business organization, meaning they're kind of causally related. So you have the one because you have the other. Or take um, the case of the term book. Um, in this case, you find um, instantiating relations between the two meanings. So the type meaning and the token meaning of book. Or, and that's important for our case here, um, take the case of C, which is also polysemous, um, the meanings of C are related um, by metaphorical extension. So what's that? Well, um, in this case, you have an explanatorily and historically prior kind of root meaning of the term, namely the physical meaning of C, so perceiving with the eyes. Yeah? Uh, and this meaning kind of gets extended over time by way of metaphor to another meaning, namely the intellectual understanding meaning of C. Yeah, so in case of metaphorical extension, you have a kind of root meaning that is historically prior. This gets extended kind of by way of metaphor to another meaning over time. Okay. I think that uh, letter description fits what Betcher tells us about the term woman. So what she says is that there are actually two meanings of womanhood. The two meanings are related in that the letter, so the trans-inclusive meaning, is the result of changes performed on the former, uh, the trans-exclusive biological meaning. What starts with a particular concept and then expands it to include something that wasn't included before. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, namely trans women in this case. Okay, so I think it's fair to say that Betcher holds a polysemy view about women. Yeah, she holds that woman is polysemous. Laskowski um, explicitly agrees with this interpretation of Batcher and explicitly argues that the term woman is polysemous. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 
so much for the policy review. Now, um, the contextualist account. So here is um, Jennifer Saul about the semantics um, of women. She says, X is a woman is true in a context C, if and only if X is human and relevantly similar according to the standards at work in C, the context, to most of those possessing all of the biological markers of female sex. So Saul's definition builds on the idea that a person is a woman if and only if she is relevantly similar to most females, yeah, to most of those possessing all of the biological markers of female sex, uh, most females, <laughs> uh, and which person counts as relevantly similar mm, depends on the context of utterance and especially the standards at work uh, in this context. So for instance, if I utter the sentence, I am a woman in this context, then this is true in this context. If I'm human, yes, and relevantly similar according to the standards at work in this context to most of those possessing all of the biological markers of female sex. Which standard of similarity could be at work in this context, well, for instance, standard of sincerely self-identifying as a woman. Yeah? So I'm a woman um, in my, uttered by me in my mouth would come out true in this context, would also come out true in another context in which a biological um, standard of similarity is at work. Um, for instance, the standard of having XX chromosomes. But note that um, according to the contextualist picture, if a trans woman utters, I am a woman in this context, then this sentence in her mouth um, comes out false, yeah? which is why Jennifer Saul ultimately hesitates um, to really endorse um, her contextualist approach. Esa Diaz Leon um, tries to kind of get rid of these uh, unwanted ramifications of Saul's account um, and presents a variant of Saul's picture. Mm. But um, Esther's account has been um, criticized for not really being a variantist account. So I will stick to Saul's account um, for the purposes of this talk, just to be sure to, that we have a real contextualist um, approach um, on the table here. OK, uh, which features um, of the context determines, determine which standards are at work in this context? Well, of course, in general, it's a huge challenge for contextualists uh, to identify which features of a context of utterance actually fix the semantic value of a context sensitive term. And I think that um, committing to any like specific contextualist view about um, gender terms will therefore come with a considerable amount of theoretical commitment. Saul in her paper isn't really explicit about what determine determines the standard at work in a context, but she gives us a, a real, really good clue, I would think. So according to Saul, I think it's fair to say that it depends on the doxastic attitude, so the beliefs um, of further participants in the context. So what do we believe as participants of the context about whether, um, what, uh, what needs to be the case that somebody is relevantly similar to most females or not? Right? That kind of determines which standard is at work in a context. Um, so for instance, if I utter trans women are women um, in this context, then this is true if my conversational partners, um, so basically you, um, are in agreement with me, Saul says, that trans women are relevantly similar in some respects, so for example, in sincerely self-identifying as a woman uh, to most of those possessing all of the biological markers for female sex. So um, the beliefs, yeah, what people of the context believe um, um, about what needs to be fulfilled to be relevantly similar to most females, that's like the decisive issue here, what determines the standard at work in the context according to Saul. Okay, that's it. That was the first part in which I presented the two proposals. So the polysemy view, um, and a contextualist account about women. Now in the second part of the talk, uh, it's decision time, okay? 
So as you've probably noted, uh, the difference between the two accounts uh, is kind of subtle. So proponents of both accounts agree that um, the term woman expresses different semantic values depending on context. And in this sense, means different, can mean, yeah, means different things in different contexts. Um, the difference lies in why the term woman expresses different semantic values. So according to the contextualist account, you have one context sensitive meaning. And according to the polysemy view, you have several, two or maybe more, um, but only a handful of um, different uh, standing meanings. Okay, so the difference is kind of subtle. So the question is, um, is there a reliable way to decide on which of these two views to choose? And I think there actually is. So um, luckily, Barbara Fetter and Emmanuel Fieberman in a 2016 paper in full imprint uh, have developed five criteria to determine um, whether an expression is polysemous or context sensitive um, in the discussion about the semantics of modals such as may. Okay, and I think we can use uh, two of these criteria, mm, namely one criterion relating to the number of candidate semantic values and one relating to the relations among candidate semantic values. And we can see that these two criteria better fit the polysemy view than the contextualist account. Um, so they developed five criteria. I only use two of them. Why? Because I think the other three criteria are not really relevant uh, to our case, but if you're interested in that, I can say more on this um, in the Q&A. Okay, so I will discuss um, these two criteria in turn now, um, starting with the first. So, what um, Fieman and Feta say is the following. So an expression is likely to be context sensitive if it has many candidate semantic values and likely to be merely polysemous if it has only few candidate semantic values. So the idea is that there are a lot more semantic values that context sensitive expressions could have um, than there are candidate semantic values for polysemous terms. Yeah. For instance, um, look at the term newspaper again, then you see that newspaper has maybe a handful of candidate semantic values, so one for a business organization, maybe one for a printed publication token, one for a printed publication type, and maybe a few more, but that's about it. Um, but now compare that to the case of tall, for instance, and you see that, well, tall, mm, has as many candidate semantic values as there are standards of tallness. So really quite many, I think. So a context can be such that things in this context are tall, like regarding that standard of tallness, regarding this standard of tallness, regarding another standard of tallness, and so on and so on. So there are really um, quite many options here. And in this sense, um, there can be very many contextually relevant comparison classes. So tall has a really large number uh, of candidate semantic values. But a context cannot be such that it contains objects that are newspapers in an equally huge variety of senses. So that's evidence um, that tall is context sensitive, while newspaper is polysemous, yeah, according to the first criterion. And that kind of seems to fit the bill. So that's kind of the standard view about these two terms, I think. Okay, good. <coughs> so mm, now, if the polysemy view is correct, mm, then woman has at least two candidate semantic values, right? Um, you could also think that woman expresses two kind of cluster concepts, maybe that's compatible with this, I think. So what would this mean? So say somebody wants to count the number of women somewhere in some context and add as an instance of two in this context. You know, of sentence two, there are X women. Um, and this sentence can be true in the mouth of one speaker, but false when added by a speaker who uses the term women in its different meaning. Yeah, so silly example but think um, of a gynecologist 
who utters an instance of two and who is looking for, I don't know, um, the number of potential patients for his office or something, okay? Then the sentence that he is uttering um, can be true, but if the same sentence is uttered by a, say, trans-inclusive feminist, then the same sentence may be false in the mouth of the feminist um, because he is using term women um, with its gender-related sense, while the gynecologist is using women with the sex-related sense. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. Mm, that's a picture that results from the polysemy view. And um, I can kind of hear um, cognitively access the two meanings um, of women here. So I can somewhat hear that there's somewhat a sex-related sense and maybe a gender-related sense, okay? Mm, but now when you think of Saul's account, mm, then you see that women, according to her account, um, has a considerably high number of candidate semantic values. So not only two or maybe three, but really, really many, okay? Why is that? Well, first of all, let's go back to the case of tall, yeah, and look at one. So the X tall persons. And how many true instances of this sentence there can be uh, depends on how many different standards of tallness can be at work in different contexts. Um, and because there's a really large number of standards of tallness, you know, because there can be very many contextually relevant comparison classes, mm, there's also a very large number of potentially true sentences about the number of tall persons somewhere. So you might be tall for, persons can be tall for a one-year-old, for a two-year-old, for a three-year-old, for a three-and-a-half-year-old, for a basketball player, for a theoretical philosopher, for a jockey, and so on and so on. So you see that there's really high number of options. Um, and again, I think that the different readings of tall um, are like easy to hear. Yeah, they're, they're easily accessible, I think, for a competent speaker. And I can think of different contexts in which tall is used um, in relation to different comparison classes. And I think if the relevant standards or the, the relevant comparison classes are made salient by the speaker, um, then we usually don't hesitate to see the resulting sentences about the number of tall persons um, as true. Okay, now back to the case of woman. So um, if Saul is correct, then how many true instances of two, there are X women, uh, there can be depends on how many different standards of similarity can be at work. Okay. Um, what standards of similarity are there, for example? Well, Saul mentions a few in her paper. So I've already said, like, there might be the standard of similarity uh, of sincerely self-identifying as a woman or biological standard having XX chromosomes. But Saul also mentions possessing all of the biological markers of womanhood, for instance. But also, and that's kind of interesting for our case, uh, playing the role of a physically weak dependent helpmate for men. Yeah, that might also be a standard of similarity that can be at work in a particular context, according to Saul's account. What kind of context? Well, a context in which participants erroneously believe that all females share the feature of playing the role of a physically weak dependent helpmate for men. Okay, because which standard of similarity is at work in a particular context, according to Saul, depends on what the participants believe um, about who is relevantly similar to most females and who isn't in this context. So if this standard of similarity would be invoked, you might think that Saul would say, okay, X is a woman is true in a context if X is human and relevantly similar in playing the role of a weak dependent helpmate for men to most of those possessing all of the biological markers of female sex. Now, that's not quite true because Saul would say that this standard of similarity is actually too deep, deeply mistaken yeah, to pick out anybody, which is why she would deem an instance of X as a woman um, as lacking truth value. Okay, so that's a particular feature of her account. But what, what's like relevant um, for us now is that, well, 
speakers can hold um, all kinds of true belief about features that most females share. So doing most or all care work, being able to menstruate, having less power than most men, being more likely to experience epistemic injustice, and so on and so on. So the thing is that participants in a context can hold numerous true or false beliefs about which features most of those possessing all of the biological markers of female sex share. Um, and this is why um, on Saul's account, there are also numerous correspondence standards of similarity that can be at work in a particular context. So on what Saul tells us then, uh, the number of possible standards of similarity should be maybe not as high as that of tall, but really, really high. <laughs> yeah? So if women truly were context sensitive in the way described by Saul, and then a number of candidate semantic values of women would be rather high too, yeah, as would be the number of possibly true instances um, of the sentence number two. Okay, and I don't know about you, um, but to me this kind of picture is um, really surprising, because while in the case of tall, um, the possible readings of tall, kind of easily accessible for me, I can kind of hear them, um, the very high number of different true instances of um, there are X women, um, that would result from source contextualist picture um, are clearly not that easily accessible. Yeah, I think that a lot of explanation would be necessary to get my interlocutor, my interlocutors as a speaker, um, even to understand which of those supposedly possible semantic candidates for women I as the speaker aim for. Um, and I do not think uh, that most of us would really see all of these resulting readings of sentence number two. Um, as true. Yeah. So I think mm, intuitively, uh, we can say that the number of candidate semantic values for women um, appears to be rather small, uh, clearly much smaller um, than um, that of the context sensitive um, expression tall or other context sensitive expressions such as I or, or, or something. Okay. I think that that should be given at least some evidential weight against the context sensitivity view about women and for the glycemia view. Because if you come back to the first criterion, then Fieber and Fanta say, well, an expression is likely to be context sensitive if it has many candidate semantic values and likely to be merely polysemous if it has few candidate semantic values. I think it's much more intuitive to say that woman um, has only a few candidate semantic values, if any, uh, and not so many as like the classic context sensitive expressions have. Um, and I think that that's evidence um, for the polysemy view and against the context sensitivity account. Okay, it's all a, a matter of probability. So the evidence is not conclusive. Yeah. Um, because in principle, there could also be context sensitive expressions that have a small number um, of candidate semantic values. And some polysemous expressions also have maybe a rather high number of candidate semantic values, maybe over is an example here. So, but it's, it's a matter of probability, but I think it's enough um, to shift the burden of proof clearly towards the contextualist um, account. Okay, so that was the first criterion. Let's go on uh, to the second. Okay, second criterion is that. So if among an expression's candidate semantic values, we find some of the typical structures of polysemy, uh, Fieban and Fetter say, and then this is good evidence in favor of polysemy and against mere context sensitivity. Okay, so for example, look at the term I, mm, the indexical I, then you see that none of the candidate semantic values of I um, takes some kind of priority um, to the other candidate semantic values. Yeah, but that's different, um, for instance, in the case of long. So in this case, um, the spatial candidate semantic values take priority, like historical prior priority, um, over the terms temporal candidate semantic values. So the spatial candidate semantic values were first, and then by some kind of 
magic, yeah, uh, extension, strength, pragmatic strengthening, something. Um, the, uh, uh, the temporal candidates um, like evolved. Okay, um, and that's good evidence, like according to the to the second criterion, that long is polysemous uh, and context sensitive, and I is merely context sensitive. Okay, that's that's the idea. Okay, now I already told you that according to Betcha and Laskowski, um, the trans inclusive meaning of the term woman is the historical result of an expansion of the expression's trans-exclusive meaning. Um, as far as I can see, Betsch and Laskowski do not explicitly support this assumption of a trans-exclusive kind of root meaning uh, with any empirical evidence. And I think that the exact etymology of women is a case to study for historical linguists, maybe, and not uh, philosophers of language. Um, but I mean, it's interesting to see whether we can find some more arguments uh, in favor of some kind of priority structure in the semantics of women. Because if we can, then this is further evidence in favor of polysemy and against the context sensitivity account. And I think we can find uh, some further argumentative support for that. So there are a few things that I want to comment on now. First of all, Laskowski says that large groups of speakers have begun using the term woman clearly as a gender term recently. This seems to imply that its meaning descends historically from an original one, which is interesting because historical connectedness is one of the hallmarks of polysemy. So Laskowski argues that historically speaking, and a trans-inclusive meaning has only just entered mainstream discourse. And this seems kind of right, um, which is why the idea of a um, kind of root meaning of woman um, definitely has some intuitive appeal, I think. This is probably also why it's kind of sneaked into um, the contextualist account too. So according to Saul, um, Laura is a woman, for example, is true in a context if Laura is relevantly similar to most of those possessing all of the biological markers of female sex. So you would think that for an understanding of what it means to be a woman, according to the contextualist account, um, a speaker has to have some understanding of what it means to be of female sex, right? Um, Saul even says that biological sex traits are somehow of central importance um, of womanhood. But of course, from a linguistic perspective, um, it would be more natural to represent such a priority structure by an appeal to polysemy uh, and not to context sensitivity. Second, um, the idea that the meanings of women are related um, by the relation of a diachronic metaphorical extension, um, I think matches what linguists have discovered about other cases. So I'm not a linguist. I'm <laughs> maybe a philosopher of language, but definitely not a linguist. So I hope I, I got the literature on this right. Um, but um, when I understand it correctly, then what linguists have discovered is that meaning changes are not at all random in direction, yeah? but they follow certain patterns and um, paths of semantic change as the linguist um, Elizabeth Traugott calls them. Now, meaning changes over time need not conform to these patterns. Um, but it's clear that like these um, tendencies or patterns that you can find um, are helpful to analyze meaning change prospectively. So meaning change that will happen in the future, um, but also retrospectively, which is important for our case here. So meaning change that has already happened uh, in the past. So patterns that you can find is, mm, well, are the following, meaning change often proceeds from more objective to the more subjective, more concrete to the abstract, um, uh, somewhat external to the internal, from the physical to the more mental. So you shouldn't take that too seriously, I think. So don't um, like think that that's meant 
literally, um, as for example, Eve Sweet, so it's also a big, big in a, in a linguistic debate about meaning change, uh, puts it, you need to analyze these metaphorical mappings, so the objective and the subjective, external and internal and so on, um, at the appropriate level of generality. Yeah, but I think you can see um, what linguists mean here by looking at a few examples. So for instance, um, meaning concerning time, so the more abstract, um, are regularly derived from meanings concerning space, yeah, the more concrete. And the idea here is apparently that time intervals are metaphorically thought of as being like distances in space. Okay, so for example, in the case of before, um, the space meaning was first, and from that, the time meaning um, evolved. And you never find meaning change in the other direction from, from time to space. It's always in this direction, um, from space to time. Now I'll take the case of C again, um, in which the physical, external, kind of objective meaning of perceiving with the eyes was first, um, and the mental, more subjective, internal meaning um, evolved from that. So, Linguists have discovered, I think, that there are regular, like one-way directions in semantic change. And also that depending on which kind of meaning an expression has right now, um, certain meaning changes are more likely to happen in the future than others. Yeah? Or depending on which kind of meaning an expression had in the past, um, certain meaning changes were more likely to happen um, than others. So in general, um, for example, Eve Sweetser argues that metaphor uh, is a structural part of our meaning system and that the domain of the physical, concrete, external is often extended to the internal domain of the mental or the abstract. And this adding of particular meanings by way of metaphorical extension, um, and this is where it gets interesting for us um, again, uh, regularly leads to polysemous expressions. So. Here's Switzer. Mm, she says that a pervasive and coherently structured system of metaphors underlies our tendency to use vocabulary from the external socio-physical domain in speaking of the internal, emotional, and psychological domain. Historically, this metaphorical system has guided the course of numerous semantic changes, and synchronically, it is represented by numerous polysemous words and extended abstract uses of physical world vocabulary. Okay, so why do I tell you all this? Um, well, because I think that this whole linguistic picture about meaning change um, actually fits the polysemy view about women um, quite well yeah, in, in at least two respects. So first, um, Proponents of the polysemy view can argue, I think, that these, the biological, physical, external, sex-related meaning of woman um, is the historically prior kind of root meaning of the more internal, more abstract meaning of woman that focuses on mental self-identification. Okay, so such an extension of the biological meaning would reflect um, a known pattern of semantic change. You could say that uh, many other expressions have walked this path uh, of semantic change before. Okay? Now that doesn't mean, of course, that the meaning extension of women happened kind of naturally or completely on its own or so, um, but it simply makes it less surprising um, from a linguistic perspective, I think. Secondly, um, as for example, also Evans and Wilkins say, um, also to linguists, uh, it has become a standard assumption that semantic change from meaning A to B normally involves a transitional phase of polysemy, where a form has both meanings. Yeah. And again, I think proponents of the polysemy view um, can easily take up on that and argue that we are currently in a kind of transi transitional phase in which the term woman is polysemous. Yeah, has both meaning, the sex-related external meaning and uh, uh, gender-related more internal mental meaning, and that this is the result of an extension of the terms um, 
historically prior kind of root biological meaning. Okay, so from a linguistic perspective, um, such a kind of diachronic change that can be described by proponents of the polysemy view um, would be nothing out of the ordinary, I think. And numerous expressions in the history of our language have undergone phases of polysemy, yeah, and many more will probably follow. Um, so what Batcher and Laskowski suggest with their polysemy view reflects kind of a known pattern of semantic change. That's kind of my point. So coming back um, to the second criterion, I think you can see that, well, um, women uh, actually uh, exhibit some of the typical structures of polysemy. And this is good evidence in favor of polysemy and against mere context sensitivity. Now, it would not be super surprising to claim that the meanings of women stand in a relation of metaphorical extension, um, which is a typical structure of polysemy. Yeah. Okay, so adding up the evidence, um, I think there's good reason to suppose that if the meaning of women really is semantically variable, then you should prefer the polysemy view over the contextualist account. That brings me to the third and final part. So in this last part, um, I want to very briefly relate back to something that I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the talk in the introduction, namely uh, the consequences of opting for a polysemy view. Now, on the one hand, for an uh, or ameliorative um, project, um, on, on the other hand, uh, for the interpretation of certain disagreements about women. Okay. First, um, I think which consequences the polysemy view has for the ameliorator's endeavor eventually depends on what exactly this endeavor is, right? So uh, if ameliorators aim at changing the intention, um, of the term woman, for example, then the polysemy view has different consequences for their project than in case conceptual engineering, for example, is all about speaker's meaning or so. But say the ameliorator's project is to, to um, change the meaning of the term woman, um, and woman really is polysemous. Yeah? Um, then I think there are specific questions for the ameliorators to ask. Um, resulting from the polysemy view, and these questions would be different in case contextualism turns out to be correct. So, for example, one question for ameliorators to ask is, um, well, should we eliminate a sex-related meaning, and if so, um, how? Yeah, how can we do that? Should we just stop using the term woman with this meaning? Uh, who are the relevant players in this game? Is it parents, teachers? Are we all like equal here, um, so how does it work? Um, and do we want to keep a particular term for the sex-related meaning too? And if so, which term would be best and in which contexts um, should we use it? Yeah. So the point is um, different descriptive hermeneutical accounts of the semantics of gender terms um, would set different starting points for the ameliorator's project. Yeah. That's kind of all I want to say about um, this issue. Um, second issue, um, disagreements. So of course, there are consequences that the polysemy view has for the interpretation of certain disagreements about women. For example, as Roland uh, remarks in a recent paper, Daskovsky's and Batcher's uh, polysemy views imply that we trans-inclusive feminists cannot engage in a genuine disagreement with trans-exclusionary feminists, that when we seem to be disagreeing with them about who is a woman, we are really just talking past one another. Okay. As it stands here, I think um, his critique is a bit too strong, and he also um, sees that because trans-inclusive and trans-exclusionary feminists, of course, can engage in genuine disagreements. Um, so, for instance, they can be um, engaged in normative metalinguistic negotiations, uh, disagreement about which, um, in which, with which uh, meaning we should use the term woman or which concept of a woman we should employ. 
Now, in this case, they would um, genuinely disagree with each other. But of course, there's also um, like a further important point here, um, which I think many find problematic about the polysemy view, but also about the contextualist proposal. So according to the polysemy view, if a trans inclusive and a trans exclusionary feminist uh, are engaged in a dispute about trans women and about whether they are women or not, so the dispute is not metalinguistic or normative or so, but it's a dispute about whether trans women are women, um, then according to the polysemy view, the two interlocutors can both be right, of course, um, and the propositions expressed by the utterances uh, need not be in any conflict, yeah, because they can simply use the term women um, with varied meanings. So, of course, um, according to the polysemy view, trans exclusionary feminists and trans inclusive um, feminists um, like, can be engaged in a merely verbal dispute. And this is a bullet, I think, um, that supporters of the polysemy view uh, have to bite. But, um, so I don't know about you, but to me, this consequence isn't so bad um, as it might seem at first glance, because I think that many of these disputes about whether trans women are really women or not, are in fact a bit like confused. Yeah, I think it might be instructive to compare such disputes about trans women to, for instance, disputes about adoptive mothers. Yeah. And so say there is a dispute uh, in which one party says um, adoptive mothers are not mothers, although I acknowledge that adoptive mothers may be the primary caregivers of the children. Okay? And the other party replies, uh, yes, yes, they are. Yeah? Adoptive mothers are mothers. Yeah? And say that this dispute is not intended as a metalinguistic dispute about which concept of a woman or and best to use or how we should use the, uh, the term mother, yeah? Mm, so it's really meant as a dispute about whether adoptive mothers are mothers or not. And I would say, in this case, there's something wrong about this dispute. Um, so this dispute might just be confused and a merely verbal dispute because mother seems to be an ambiguous term that is ambiguous between a biological kind of genetic meaning of mother and a social caregiving sense of mother. And for me, there's not such a strong reason uh, to not see such disputes about adoptive mothers and disputes about whether trans women are women or not um, in a way analogously. Okay. I think um, we need to discuss this um, some more, um, but I think it's fair to say that proponents of the polysemy view can, their way, ways for them to react to such kind of disagreement based objections. Yeah. So all of this needs more discussion, um, but I hope that my talk at least showed that the polysemy view is a serious contender uh, in the debate about the semantics of gender terms and that it should be preferred uh, to a contextualist account. Thanks so much. <laughs>